Hello, uh, welcome to our lecture series on programming for powerlifting that I'm doing for the online strength coach.com. If you haven't uh, heard already or seen any of my social media stuff, um, online strength coach.com is now live. So the idea well, behind online strength coach is that first and foremost, it's uh, my online training business. So if you want uh, to be trained for any strength sport, really, but mainly towards powerlifting and unequipped powerlifting, then that's the portal you should go through. Um, you can send an email to speedpowerperformance.gmail.com if you're interested in, in utilizing any of those services that I render. Um, behind the actual website itself, it's going to be targeted at intermediate to advanced unequipped powerlifters, primarily that equip that, that compete within the IPF or within a drug test equivalent. However, there's been a lot of information that are going to be relevant for strength training, strength programming, and specifically powerlifting. Um, as you'll see from this lecture series we're going to go through, we're basically, we've done lecture one, which was the, the annual plan, how to put together your training plan when you have your competition schedule for the year, and how you, you put in the different kind of blocks. So now over the next three to four lectures, we're going to go over the different kinds of training blocks, how to put them together, how to put together the loading cycles for them, and what the goals of these uh, training blocks are, and how to best implement them within your own training. So today's lecture, uh, we're going to go over putting together a technique or a volume cycle. So these are probably the most important cycles when it comes to beginner lifter or an, in an intermediate lifter or a lifter who has um, inadequate time under the bar, they don't have a practice technique, they don't have a good technique. Uh, they're also incredibly important for further cycles, so for an advanced or intermediate lifter, they probably won't get stronger using these programs, but what they will do, they'll get a they'll get a work capacity or a volume load stimulus that we just however how we did as we discussed in the previous lecture, this overload or volume stimulus is what allows you to handle higher workloads or overloads or, 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 or a workload that is going to represent a physiological overload or an overreach which is going to result in you getting stronger further down the line. Yeah. Okay, so let's begin. Okay, first of all, where do these cycles come into the training plan? Technique cycles, as we mentioned previously, are at the intro, they can be used as a base for future work for an intermediate or advanced lifter. They're basically your volume load or your work capacity training. This is the work you're going to feed off for the 6 to 12 weeks post volume or technique cycle. And they're, they're what you should use to introduce a novice lifter to the sport. And they give them time under the bar. They give them opportunity to get familiar with the lifts. They give you, if you're coaching a lifter, they give you the opportunity to spend a lot of time going over techniques, um, going over squat technique, bench technique, deadlift technique, uh, going over why these are relevant for rules, so on and so forth. They could follow a number of progression models. We'll go over five progression models um, in the next slide and we'll discuss them, how they're useful within a technique setting, how they work, how they're put together, and how, and how you can implement them. Basically, there's three types. There's a linear, which is typically it'll start from high volume, low intensity, and then go to high intensity, low volume over a set period, four to six weeks, or can go up to as much as 24 weeks in some training plans. You get static, so this is basically, you're just working on technique and technique alone, so the weight in the bar will not change for four to six weeks. We'll go over this kind of training model. This is where it becomes very, in, uh, very important to utilize a qualitative-based approach, or to use a deliberate practice based approach. We will go over deliberate practice uh, as, it, as it relates to powerlifting at the end of this lecture. 
but basically it's um, every rep needs to be analyzed. We need to utilize objective feedback where we can get it, and a coach is incredibly important for this kind of block or this kind of practice. Sending away a novice to do five sets of five on an exercise without any feedback is not deliberate practice, and it's only going to lead to a, to a level of execution which is normally an inadequate or unsatisfactory level of execution. Basically what you'll happen, what, what you'll get if someone does a beginner program like 5x5 five five, such as starting strength or whatever the one Mandy does, I can't fucking remember. Um, but yeah, basically a, a static load or a static sets and reps and where the volume remains static, the frequency remains static, and the lifter normally tries to increase the weight in a linear fashion. Normally, technique will reach a certain level and then won't progress under that uh, practice model uh, for a number of reasons. And then we have an undulating approach. We'll discuss when we discuss when we go over the undulating approach, how it works, why it works, and how it's been blown out of all proportion recently. And with daily undulating periodization. And then during this lecture, we're going to also cover laying out the block, how to split up the week, exercise selection, session structure, and then finally how to put it all together into a training cycle. Okay, so loading plans for the cycle. We can go over a, a high volume to a low rate, moving towards low volume high weight, such as a linear program. Typically, a pro these programs or these blocks will be four to six weeks in length. The length of the block will determine on the loading plan or the loading cycle or the basically the cycle that you choose to run. Some loading cycles are four weeks, some are six. That will be influenced by your own choice. You can follow a frequency from anywhere to three, one to three times per lift typically. We can go up to six times per lift, however that requires a bit more of a nuanced approach, a bit more of an in-depth understanding uh, of how to utilize that high frequency of training because it can become very easy to enter an overreach state utilizing that amount of frequency. Uh, if you don't understand what you're doing, or you don't have, don't have a, a coach there to provide feedback on your execution. During a technique cycle or a work capacity based cycle for more advanced lifters, what this is, we should be using set loads that the lifter can make with good technique. We shouldn't be looking to do AMRAMs. We shouldn't be looking to do uh, RMs for sets. We should be looking to go on to the next point, which is to undercook the lifter's max or undercook the percentages to allow good movement throughout the entire block. Because that's the overreaching goal of the block is to come out with um, a better work capacity for an advanced lifter or for an intermediate to novice lifter to come out with a better skill element or to come out with a better a better technique than when you enter the cycle. Okay, we're gonna go over different loading cycles you can utilize for a training cycle for a training block like this. Okay, so here we have a five week linear block. So this is based off Ed Cohen's comp pull up, uh, based off his percentages. So Ed Cohen had a training DVD from a while ago. Um, where he did it, he had his 10, 10 or 12 week build up to the world at the time. He had his weights, and then his, based off his weights, uh, someone on the MISC, or bodybuilding.com MISC, or it might have been the powerlifting forums, it probably more likely the powerlifting forums than the MISC, uh, worked out the percentages of those sessions, so a few years ago, like 2011 or 2012, uh, I condensed it into a five-week linear block that's uh, used historically very successfully with myself and a lot of other lifters. It's a frequency of one because each session is pretty difficult. This is maybe not something I would choose for most lifters for a technique block, uh, although it is a very effective block if you only train once a week you will get results off the back end of it if you've never ran it before. Uh, week 1 intensity, 75%, 3 sets of 10, frequency of 1. Next week 2, 78%, 3 sets of 8, frequency 24. 
Week 3, 83.5%, 3 sets of 6, frequency 18. Week 4, 88%, 4 by 4, a little overload week. We have a volume of 16. And then finally, 3 by 3 at 90%, and a frequency of 1 and a volume of 9. Basically, you'll run this once a week for squat, once a week for bench press, and once a week for deadlift. And that's the program. It's very straightforward, very simple. You're going to need to utilize a lot of assistance work to produce a bit more of a volume atmosphere, a bit more of a volume heavy environment to get the work capacity you really want. If you're going to, if, you, if you're a lifter that utilizes one session a week and you're intermediate to advanced, then this is a very good cycle to utilize as a kind of volume block or a or intro block into maybe more of an overreach or an overload based program in a very effective program one I would recommend you try if you've not seen it before okay so the next block will cover four week linear block based off INOL if you're not aware of what INOL is I will you can check out the um, link section on the article well we posted it on cast iron strength or sorry on online strength coach.com uh, where this video will be hosted. It stands for intensity by number of lifts. It's a formula that was created by, I can't remember the name of the fellow, but it was really, it was published on Powerlift and Watch in 2002. Uh, the PDF still up on Powerlift and Watch. Something that you can utilize to determine the intensity of a, of a total session or a week. Quite useful tool. Probably one of the lesser known tools within programming or on the internet, one of the better kept secrets. Um, so basically what this is a frequency of two. It's a it's a it's a linear cycle as you'll see from the from the graph, very easy to follow. Here's volume, starts high, finishes low, here's intensity, starts low, finishes high. Straightforward. Basically, this is based off the INOL chart. So anything from 0 to 0 0.4 is an undertraining stimulus. 0 0.4 to 0 0.9 is an easy training stimulus. 1 to 2 is a difficult session. And the closer it gets to 2, the more of an overreach it is. And from 2 and above, we're talking an overreach session. So 1 is basically the optimal uh, volume for that intensity. So here we have 75% for 5 to 5. That produces an INOL of 1. That is an optimal load for that frequency and for that intensity. An optimal volume for that intensity. The frequency of 2 gives us a, a weekly INOL for that lift of 2, which again, if you look at the weekly chart, produces a tough stimulus but makeable. It's basically uh, at the bottom end of the training or overreaching cycle. So it's basically optimal as we can go utilizing that method of determining the intensity of the session. So week one, 75% of RM, five sets of five, two sessions in the week, because of volume of 50. Week two, 80%, five sets of four, two sessions, volume of 40. Week three, five sets of three in the session, 85% of RM, two sessions a week is the volume of 20, 30. And then finally, week four, 90%, five by two is 10 lifts in the session, two sessions because it's 20 lifts. Each one of these weeks has an IO1L of two. Each one of these sessions has an INOL of one. This is probably going to be a very good cycle for anyone who's intermediate. Possibly a good cycle for someone who is advanced. Um, if you're someone who has a long training history of utilizing a frequency of one, maybe you've utilized 531 for the last year or two years, you've reached a, a level of development where once a week stop working uh, as a natural, this is the sort of training you can maybe look at, the sort of training cycle you can look at for a technique based or a volume based block to put you in a good stead for going forward into like an overreach or something. You could run concurrently two, three times, four times. 
and just nudge up your max slightly each time. Uh, it's something that you can utilize at 95% load max if you really want to just take a, like a linear uh, technique block starting from a reasonable volume of 50 weeks, uh, 50 lifts in the week and then finish in on a there's quite a good volume of 90% of 20 lifts in the week and it can be run concurrently block to block uh, and take like a bit of a linear trajectory it's obviously not going to work indefinitely eventually this loading pattern or stimulus is going to stop working so you need to be aware that you might need to change your approach on on this so uh, for technique or as a technique block per se as an intermediate to advanced lifter you probably want to run something like this maybe a maximum of nine weeks or sorry 12 weeks any more than that you're probably going to start stagnating okay here we have a six week undulating block so a very easy way to see the difference between a a linear program and an undulating program a weekly undulating program here we have an intense intensity in the blue here we have volume in the red check how different this uh, block is we have Intensity in the blue again, volume in the red, much more wavy. The emphasis changes from week to week. They don't really stop start swapping um, with any pattern until week three, four, and then week five finish on like a peak or what is um, a bit more of a linear sort of loading pattern from that week to that week. This still has a linear element to it, as we'll discuss. So week one, 65%, six sets of six, frequency of two. Week two, 80%, six sets of four, frequency of two. So we just look at this very acutely. Week one, 65% RM is quite easy. High volume in the session. Week two, we have a higher percentage, but a moderate percentage. It's starting to get in towards what I have termed the meaningful percentage ranges before. So 80 to 100% is meaningful percentage. It's basically where you're going to train for overload. Um, six sets of four, uh, 24 reps per session, which is fairly moderate, quite a good stimulus. 36 reps per session, given a correct percentage, can either be a hell of an overload session. So that's the sets of reps scheme you'll utilize on something like Russian squat routine or Russian squat masters. That's six by six at 80% that you build up to in the first three weeks or the first, uh, four and a half weeks on Russian squat masters is one of the most difficult sessions you'll do if you complete if you get the load correct on the squat and you follow it um, to its conclusion one hell of an overload uh, one hell of an overload session or at 65 percent it can be a taxing but moderate session so weeks one three and five are volume based weeks Week two, four, and six are our intensity based weeks. Week three, we've got 70%. We see we can drop 30. Oh, bad math. We'll drop two reps or 12 reps in the week. Week three to five, we've dropped 10 reps in the week. We've gone up to 5%. We've gone to five to five. On week four, 85%. Five by three, 30. So we've dropped 18 reps from week two. And then for week six, we've gone from 16 to 30, so we've dropped 14 reps. Um, this kind of loading pattern is very good for uh, sustained progress. It's something that when you get in, so realistically, when we put together this kind of training block for an, uh, anyone that's intermediate and above, this is when we start following more of a, what you might call a Borshiko inspired approach that six sets of six will not be done at 65 percent 65 percent will be the average intensity we, this is kind of like a flat sets of rep scheme that you can utilize well uh, and will work however when we look at a more detailed approach that we won't cover in this lecture because it's too nuanced too detailed to put across um, in the time that we have Maybe something that we'll cover in another lecture further down the track. We want to spread the load as much as possible. So, for instance, if there's 36 reps of volume and an average intensity of 65%, we could have two sets of eight at 50%, two sets of two at 90%, all within the same session. 
Um, so yeah, it, <laughs> it, become, it can become a lot more varied uh, if you take a more detailed and nuanced approach. Where this is good is because you're on you're undulating or you're changing the stimulus, so you're relying on volume one week, you're relying on intensity the next week, and it's much more variable. There's still a linear element to it. So if you look at the intensities, 65, 70, 75, 80, 85, 90, there's a linear element from week one, three, and five. So in the volume based part of the program, there's a linear element in it. In the intensity based part of the program, there's the same linear thread going through it. Jump up to 5% on each week. We decorate the volume. Um, 18 reps, then 14 reps, so we're losing volume or increasing intensity through the three weeks. The exact same thing is happening on the volume based weeks. They're both producing a slightly different stimulus. The volume stimulus creates fatigue through repetition, more of a metabolic effort. The intensity based approach produces fatigue through intensity of effort, uh, being more prolific with your efforts. The 90% week's probably the most fatiguing of the weeks. Uh, Volume-wise, week one's probably the most fatiguing of the volume-based weeks. But within the program, there's a linear element with it. All programs have a linear element towards them. Whether it's, so on a typical linear program, you'll see this configuration. On a Boris Yuko based program, you'll see this. The line will be jaggy as fuck on the way up, but the trend is up. But we reach there by a winding path rather than just a straight path. Because the winding path can go up for much longer. It include, includes down weeks, up weeks, volume overloads, intensity overloads. Uh, it's the more successful of the two approaches, but to program for it, you require a deeper understanding of the lifter and of the of programming as more of an art form than a science, although there is a lot of science behind it. And then finally, we have the four week subjective block or the technical reinforcement block. As you'll see, there is no deviation here whatsoever. We're just doing five sets of five with three, frequency of three at 70%. This can be done at 60% if you want. This is something we'll definitely use for a novice or someone who has terrible technique. And if you wanted to just take the time to coach the movement as much as possible. What this needs, this needs video to look back at the sets, discuss where they went wrong, where they went right. This requires a coach to look at the video, to determine technical changes that need to be done, changes in setup, changes in how to address the bar. This ideally would have something like a gym aware on it or some kind of, or if you take the video, some bar tracking software to look at the bar speed. From one week one to four, we can look at the not only the bar path, which is also incredibly important information for that objective feedback. And squat and deadlift, we want a straight bar path, and in bench press, we want a diagonal bar path towards the head, uh, from the chest towards the head. Um, but the bar speed can let us quantify the progress or the lack of progress that the lifter might be making from a strength aspect. Basically, in week one, if they move the bar at, say, 0.6 meters per second on an average, and by week four, they're moving at 0.9 meters per second average, we can infer they've got stronger. Either they've become stronger through increased fret efficiency from better technique, or the volume's just basically taken hold and they've got stronger physiologically. Okay, so there are four uh, training cycles that you can utilize the ins and outs of them and how they work and how you can utilize them and the scenarios you can utilize them within your own training. Okay, on with the show or the presentation. Disappear. Okay, determining lift frequency. Lifters shouldn't dramatically jump up in frequency. This is a really bad idea. This is normally what happens with Smolov. Uh, it's the common example we can utilize. This is when a lifter will go from training once a week, maybe on something like 5 through one stall out and go, well, I really need to change things. So I'm going to jump on small of, which is four times a week. A terrible, not terrible uh, program, but really um, hard overreaching program. 
normally they'll run the base cycle, which is the volume part of that program, or that uh, work capacity part of that program. They'll run the base cycle, take their 20 kilos or whatever, and then either get injured four or five weeks down the line, three months down the line, or uh, burn out. Smolov is not a good idea if you're not used to training at at least three times a week and with reasonable intensity. Frequency should be dictated by the difficulty of the session. So if you do something like West Side, where you're going for max effort or you're going for max repetition effort, then the frequency that the West Side utilizes of one is perfect. R2, once for max effort, once for rep effort. Well, that does alternate, as you'll understand if you've done West Side before. It's very good because you're basically going 100% in some aspect in those sessions. So the frequency of one is very appropriate for that program. Something the likes of the INOL program that we looked at just there would be two, two frequency. Frequency two is quite good for that because they are slight overload sessions, but they're not an overreach session. To take that to three times a week, you run into problems. And if we're doing something, for instance, like a three time week program, then something the likes of 60% five by five, 60% RM, five to five, or as we looked at the static program, 70%, five to five. Each one of those sessions will produce a small training stimulus, if any, together through the week they will produce training stimulus, but each session is easy enough that that higher frequency can be maintained across the training block. Normally, in this order, bench press, squat, and then deadlift will respond to frequency better. Bench press, typically, most programs will train at least twice a week. You can get trained up to five to six times a week. Squat, most programs will train once a week. However, two to four times can work on that. If you look at some of the res or that one research study done with Norwegian powerlifters, bench press and squat both uh, responded very well to having the same volume, the same program basically split into two. So instead of having a frequency of three, they had a frequency of six. The frequency of six had much better outcomes from the one RM, even though the training load, the intensities were the same in both programs. And deadlift, they, they didn't show that same response. So a frequency of one to two for deadlifts are normally pretty good. Um, three can be utilized if someone really struggles with the technique, but you need to undercook deadlift even more than squat from a from an intensity of session standpoint because it's very easy to break down uh, your postural integrity, which really increases the the fatigue you take from that session dramatically. And pretty easy to put across. The higher the frequency you utilize, the more opportunities you're going to have to learn the lift and to introduce exercise variation, which can be very important for skill learning. Lift variations, novice lifters benefit the most from just doing a simple lift-based program. They don't really need to be doing chains, box squats, front squats, zombie squats, overhead squats, soft squats, soft press, uh, zercher squats, camber bar squats, sit squat bar, <laughs> you get the idea. They need a barbell and to lift the competition standard for about 90% of the training. The more they can get, um, more, the more time with the coach they can get performing competition technique, the better for them. Where you can, where you can cue it is you can juxtapose it against a competitive lift. So, for example, if someone is really struggling with knee control on a squat, you can use Goldus squat to cue up that knee position, get them to sit down into the bottom range, get them to push their knees out physically with their arms, pause it, handle them, make sure their posture is good, get them to stand, maybe do set 20 of that. And then go perform a set of five on back squat at like 60 to 70 percent and cue it up each time watch the video back of each set coach them be involved with them make sure they understand and they can see the progress with their movement that's how you're going to get a, a better technique response from the lifters setting them away to do five sets of five with some gobble squats in the warm-up and no coaching is not going to make them any better all reps need to be performed to competition standard technique, even variance. So that means in a back squat, you're always squatting to correct depth, unless there's a there's a 
the point of the lift is not to, so like a high box squat, or if you have something like uh, hip turn up, the knee turn up, they need to limit the range, then obviously there's there are some variations where that doesn't apply. But to almost to all like for example in a deadlift, you should never hitch a lift. Always have a nice clean lockout. Always uh, utilize good posture for a bench press, unless it's like a spot out press or a board press. Touch the chest. Pause more times than don't pause. Um, you can utilize touch and go when you're training, obviously. But if you're a power lifter, it's better to utilize pause variations the majority of your training because that's how it's done in the competition. Um, always look to have good competition form. Some variations are very good for different problems. We'll discuss that in detail following up from now. And the practice needs to be deliberate, as we've discussed briefly, but we'll go into more detail further down the track. So for squat variations, we have pause and tempo work. So a pause squat at the bottom for three seconds, a pause squat at mid-range from the bottom, one to quarter squats, tempo work, such as five seconds down, five seconds up. These are good universally for pretty much all lifters. They're very good for learning control, learning the, the correct se sequencing from a technique standpoint. When do you lo when do you break at the hips? When do you break the knee? Where's your your hip be relative to the bar? At what point in the lift? Uh, where should your balance be on your foot? In what part of the lift? These are really good um, variations. It's something that I utilize heavily within this kind of block technique based block for all lifters of all standards. Chains and bands are great for lifters who fall forward in the lift. Uh, falling forward typically can come from a lack of knee control, it can come from a lack of ankle flexibility. More often than not though, it comes from a lack of coordination with standing out at the bottom. So you chuck a, chuck a heavy band on that, people soon learn that they should be standing up chest first into the bar uh, and they work out how to do that because if they don't, they're going to get their face slapped into the floor. So that tends to help. People learn very quickly. Uh, box variations are great for learning correct depth. So you, if you have a lifter that either squats too deep or squats too high, if you get the box squat just right so it's an unquestionable competition depth, get them to sit down, touch it. They can pause on it and stand. It's very good for regulating the depth. Uh, if, if you have lifters who have shit, either lower back control, trunk control, knee control, uh, get them to sit to the box and stand especially for people who are very inflexible, uh, have, are poor, are not great athletically, or have a lot of roadblocks to, to, to good movement, utilizing like a box squat, like a high box squat, and then moving the box down, it, it can be very useful. Getting them to sit on the box, very useful for teaching the correct movements. Also, you can give them more feedback because there's less going on, less balance, um, less things to worry about during the lift useful for novices or people who lack control. Front squats and zombie squats are again good for people who fall forward because basically the bar is balanced out in front on the clavicle and shoulders so any deviation in bar path forward or back means that they lose the bar or if they have poor ankle flexibility it's good you can, you can utilize it as a warm-up or an active stretch because they'll have to push their knees out over the toes more and um, because they need their hips in under the bar to be successful in the lift. So something if you have someone who stands up arse first out of a squat, um, bringing zombie squat into the warm up can be a very useful thing to do. It can help them quite a lot um, when it comes to their back squat. And then special bar variations can be good for off season or bring up the monotony of training. Um, this is something that if you utilize west side. That's very useful. If you don't utilize West Side, um, they can be of a limited worth. But in your off season, they're very useful because it's different. It's a little bit more fun than just training with a barbell. Bench variations. Feet up is great for lifters who are weak muscularly. So if they have, uh, if you have someone like a female lifter who's very flexible or one of the lighter weight class men who get that massive arch and half wrap it. Um, there's they rely heavily on their setup. So if they deviate, so if they come out of line towards their face, so they come out of line uh, towards the sternum, or if they get a per hand out where it's like one side's 
they get one hand before they get the other hand. I guess put it out of line from where they would like it. That can fuck them up. But if you produce a stronger lifter utilizing feet up bench press or full raw bench press and other variations like inclines, shoulder presses, dumbbell presses, they can rescue it. They'll be stronger. Um, you can rely too much on technique within bench press, especially if you utilize a high arch. Variations, close grip, floor press, chains and board presses are, are all great for lockout. One thing I wouldn't recommend on bench press would be the band, basically because the band kind of pushes you down constantly, which can be bad for your AC and makes like proper control of the bar difficult. So uh, if you're going to, the cardio and resistance is very useful for bench press, but I would definitely favor chains over bands when it came to cardio and resistance for bench press. Again, tempo, pause work, or non-touch bench press. So things like the spotter press, all great for bar control and technique. If you have someone who has an erratic bar path, getting them to do tempo, a mixture of tempo, pause, and non-touch work is great for teaching them how to control the bar through space. Get them to pause halfway up, pause on the chest, three quarters of the way up, get them to do spotto, get them to do five seconds down, five seconds up, three seconds up, three seconds down, one second up. Things like this can all help uh, for them to connect the dots on, in a movement sensor, in a skill sense, and very useful for them to, to help their bar control and help their lifting. Incline or deep incline are great variations for general work to build up weak parts of the movement. Incline bench press is great for the shoulder strength, lockout, and also um, to rescue it if you come out in a line towards the face. Decline is great for building the lats of the bench press, also helps off the chest, uh, and also great for learning to control the bar if it comes out of the line towards the sternum. Dumbbells, especially the bars, are great for hypertrophy work within bench press. For deadlift, lifters should concentrate on the competitive variant. So if you're a sumo puller, you should pull sumo. If you're a conventional puller, you should pull conventional. Probably the, the best word on this was in the Borashiko seminar in February of this year when he said, if you're a sumo, he, as a lifter, you should choose one woman and love that woman. There's no point going to different women. So you need to make the one woman happy. So in English, you basically, if you're a sumo puller, train with sumo. If you're a conventional trainer, train with conventional. Because they're both desperate skills. They require a lot of time to learn, to perfect. So perfect one. You can utilize it within your training. There's a lot of great deadlifts to do. Uh, Dan Green, Chris Duffin all utilize um, variations. Brandon Lilly all utilize different deadlift variations within training. Um, and there's a lot of all-time greats who utilize conventional only. Andy Bolton, Mark Felix, Ed Hall, Benny Magnuson all utilize conventional deadlift to conventional deadlift only within the training. As much as I know, I could be wrong on that, but to my knowledge, they only utilize the one um, deadlift method. And it was definitely something that Boris Shiko was put, pushing across. Training lifts, so lifts were done within the gym, outside of competition, should always be done with immaculate posture. Don't let yourself come out of position. Um, it's fine to come out of position on a maximum lift, but doing it in the gym, it means you can't utilize the frequencies, or utilize the volumes that you would like to ideally to get better at deadlift. Lifting with shit technique or shit posture is basically what leads people to thinking that they can only train deadlift once every two weeks, once every three weeks, once every blue fucking moon. It's because they lift with bad posture. They start utilizing posture muscles in an eccentric, concentric manner. This leads to a lot of fatigue in those muscles. They spasm, protectively spasm around the spine. You get tight, sore back, and you can't move properly for about three, four days after the session. Um, always lift, deadlift with good posture. Pause and tempo lifts, again, are great for bar position and control. Within the deadlift, they're good for working out where your hips should be and what part of, the, part of the lift. So when you come to the knee, what height should your hips be? When you come past the knee, how do you pull the bar in? When do you push your hips forward? Where should your uh, weight, your balance or your weight distribution be during the lift? Deficit is great for overloading the legs, uh, drive from the floor. Also good for helping to teach position. So if you have a lifter who maybe should lift with higher, so depending on your your structure, your leg length, your torso length, your arm length, 
you, everyone should pull with a different hip, hip position from the floor. However, um, people who lift with a high hip position can be prone to breaking their posture or rounding their back or adopting the, the shagging dog technique more than people who utilize probably more legs. Um, the higher hip lifters, the lifters with longer arms, uh, the lifters with stronger hips relative to their knees, uh, the lifters with long torso, or sorry, with short torso, long legs, these guys can be prone to like uh, losing the posture and adopting that really shit rainbow technique. For these guys, deficit pulls can teach them how to set the hips down a wee bit more, maybe try to utilize a bit more leg drive from the floor, get a better position from the floor, get a, get the bar off the floor, utilizing the quads and holding posture. Deficit can be quite good for that. For other lifters, it's quite, it's quite good just to develop speed from the floor, to show you how to utilize your legs from the floor. Um, from a coordination perspective, it can show you how to go leg drive and then hips, rather than trying to just go hips, hips, hips from the start. Block pulls are good for lockout and overload partial strength. So lifting from below the knee from a block, you can utilize 130%, 140% of what you can do. Um, it's quite intensive if you go really heavy on it. So if you do like 100, but if you utilize like 110% or even 100% of your max for like volumes you can't utilize from the floor, so that could mean that you maybe do 563 with 100% of your max from maybe a 14 or 15 inch block. That's time under tension for you in the correct posture if you hold the position that you can utilize to develop your strength from the floor. That will help you further down the line to overload um, your hip strength, overload your postural strength, overload your lower back muscles, overload your hamstring muscles, overload your glute muscles. It's quite a useful tool. Something that can be successful for some lifters and unsuccessful for other lifters depends. Bands of chains again are great for overload and lockout and developing good acceleration into the finish. If you're someone who maybe is good off the floor but then kind of gets lost between the knee to the hips, heavy chains, heavy bands can be really good to teach you um, in conjunction with pauses. Even a pause chain lift or a pause uh, band lift can be good to sh teach you where to have the bar relative to your body during the lift and uh, they can be a good digital. <laughs> uh, deciding what the lifter needs when it comes to variation, uh, novice lifters I'll classify as less than one year experience or under 300 wilts. They should spend 90% of the time on competition technique. Variants should make up about 10% of their lifting volume. Intermediate lifters I'll classify as two to four years experience or three to 400 wilts. They should spend roughly 70%, maybe 70-80% of their time on the competition technique and then use targeted variation so you'll know if your lifter maybe struggles with their position from the floor in a deadlift maybe, maybe the only variation they utilize or the two variations they utilize are pause deadlifts and deficit deadlifts to try help with that but that only makes up about 30% or 20% of their deadlift training volume, the rest, the 70 to 80% is being spent just doing deadlift, uh, whatever deadlift variation they utilize. And then advanced lifters, so four plus years of experience or 400 plus wilks, they should spend roughly about two thirds or 6% of their time on competition lifts and they require variation as necessity to help progress the skill learning. And um, as people become more experts within their field or within their practice, Variation becomes very important to help them um, unlock or progress uh, within the skill. Finally, putting it together during the week. Uh, for a one-time week program, manage your squat and assistance. So assistance can be leg extension, leg press, single leg work, anything that you would consider as assistance to help with the lift or to help with another lift. So it could be upper back work, it could be deadlift assistance work, such as hamstring work, glute work. Wednesday, you do bench press and assistance. Again, same rules apply for assistance. Friday, deadlift and assistance. And Saturday, work-ons. So work-ons can be hypertrophy for the chest, hypertrophy for the, for the triceps. It can be an extra chance today to maybe work on some squat variations, 
lighter stuff, um, with some lighter squats, some close grip bench press, basically wherever you're lacking within your program, Saturday's a chance to top up on it. Two times per week, we're looking at squat and bench press on Monday, Tuesday, deadlift and assistance work. So assistance typically within this context for me would be any kind of posterior chain heavy work you need to do, any ab work you need to do, and any upper back work you need to do, I would qualify as assistance in this setup. Any squat variations, bench press variations should be done on day one. Likewise with any deadlift variations or back work you need to do should be day two. And then we just repeat that that um, pattern with the Wednesday off, Thursday, Friday, repeat the pattern, Saturday, Sunday off. And of course your squat variations, bench variations, your assistance work and your deadlift variations can vary from session to session. Three times per week, take a very simple approach. We do all three lifts, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and on Saturday we do our assistance work and our work on so any kind of heavy abdominal work you want to do, any postural specific work you want to do, any hypertrophy work you want to do, chest hypertrophy, tricep hypertrophy, shoulder work, back work, and um, back work can be done in with these sessions. So for example, you could on the Wednesday you can maybe do some back, on Saturday you could do back, you could do some lighter back Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday if you want to take more of a high Volume approach, there's a lot of ways of skinning it, but when it comes to competition lifts, they're the focus, and we do them Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Session structure, so once you get to putting together the actual program itself, lower body and upper body should always alternate, so if you have like a squat, a bench, and a squat, that's the order it should be done, or squat, bench, so sorry, bench, squat, bench, or squat, bench, deadlift, deadlift, bench, squat, should always be alternating um, between lower body and upper body when it comes to doing the competition lifts. If you go from a squat to the deadlift, the deadlift performance will be compromised from the squat because you'll still be fatigued. If you do a bench variation in between those two, it gives you like 20 minutes or 10, 15, 20 minutes, depending on how quick you are through the exercise to recover so that your performance on the subsequent lower body exercise is better. Session priority always first. So if the session priority is your deadlift, you should deadlift first in the session, always. Competition variance should always come before a variation unless the variation is more important for the lifter's skill component. So for example, if the lifter is bad off the floor, um, then maybe deficit deadlift is more important for that lifter than deadlift. So maybe their session might go deadlift, bench press, de I'm sorry, deficit deadlift, bench press, deadlift and assistance should be at the tail end of the session or the week. So within that three day a week program, you would have seen that the session was, or sorry, assistance was at the end of the week and not during the sessions. And then finally, one thing to really take home and hammer home with deliberate practice is the key to all this. Never let a shit rep stand, look to correct that. So if you come out of shape, in your deadlift then you need to correct that in the next set or you need to lower the weight so you can perform it correctly. Video and analyze as much as many sets as many reps as you can, look for weaknesses, look for posture, look for bar path, look for a lack of coordination at certain points. Always be on the lookout for where you can improve and then try to um, address that. Look at the bar path software such as Canova and um, there's other apps available on uh, Apple or Android App Store, you can help with this. Uh, this really helps to determine optimal performance. Within the squat and the deadlift, we're looking for a straight bar path. Within the bench press, we're looking for that diagonal bar path. Having something to help you look at this from set to set is excellent for um, your technique. Squat and deadlift, postural integrity should, be should never be sacrificed for weight. So you shouldn't be looking to do Maybe in an AMRAP scenario or an overload scenario, we might deviate from this rule. In a technique scenario, you will never deviate from this. You should always maintain postural integrity, so neutral or lower dotic spine throughout the entire lift. It's very important um, for a user lifter to adhere to that. In a static loading block, path, um, and then we're talking about bar path, bar speed can help determine performance outcomes as we discussed Previously on that loading plat on that loading uh, that loading pattern or lack thereof. <laughs> Utilize all the objective feedback you can if you have a chance to get your hands on a chimaware, a push band, a video camera, 
Utilize it. Utilize it all the time. It will help you tremendously. And then finally, every rap, every rep is a chance to practice what you do in the platform. So if it's the barbell, address the barbell like it's your 1RM or your PB. If it's 60%, address every rep as if it's your PB. Squat the weight, reset yourself mentally, squat the weight, reset yourself mentally, squat the weight. Always lift like you mean it. Never, never let yourself get sloppy or use incorrect technique. Always look for, always push yourself, always look to be better with each rep when it comes to a technical standpoint. Okay, that's going to conclude this rather lengthy lecture. Um, so we're on a running time of 50 minutes. Hope you've gotten something out of it. Um, feedback, anything you'd like to see in future, please shoot me an email, speedpowerperformance.gmail.com. The lecture notes are the slides with the loading patterns and the INL. INOL chart will all be put up on the blog post on onlinestrengthcoach.com. Come and check it out. Um, appreciate that. Thank you very much for watching. Please hit that subscribe button, the like button on YouTube. It helps to grow the channel, uh, which gives me more exposure, which lets me get this information out, but also gives me a chance to get some more clients online. Money cash dollar. Uh, if you'd be interested in coach my this beard edited it, then shoot me an email, speedpartformance.gmail.com or fill out the contact form on onlinestrengthcoach.com. Hope you've enjoyed the content and uh, I'll see you in the next lecture in this series. Thank you very much for watching. I've been Mark. Goodbye.